require special considerations and adjustments. And that's due to the limited ability for the interviewer to read your body language and your facial expressions. So you landed the job interview. Now what do we do? First and foremost, whether you're interviewing virtually or whether you're interviewing um, in person, a job interview is an opportunity to sell yourself. So that is your time to shine in front of the company and to let them know why you are the best candidate for the position. So a virtual interview is, is no different. That being said, there is a big difference between virtual interviewing and in-person interviewing. Virtual interviews are most often the candidate's first exposure to the company. So maybe you had a phone screen with your recruiter Basically, this virtual interview is the first time that you're really going to be showing yourself to the company. So virtually astute candidates are the candidates that are most likely to be chosen to move forward. So what should you do first? Prepare, prepare, prepare. Preparation is an essential step in the entire interview process. Preparation requires that you do your research and anticipate what questions will be asked during the interview. So what do you do your research on? Well, you should re research the background and history of the company. You should definitely know about the particular job that you're applying to. But you should also do the background of the interviewer. Doing the research on your interviewer will help you to be somewhat familiar with the people that's on the screen, that are on the screen, and maybe help you be a bit more comfortable through the whole process. And just a note that, you know, it's okay to ask your recruiter in advance who you will be interviewing with so that you have the time to prepare and make up the person and their credentials. Also, you want to make sure your technology works. So most employers have preferred web-based conferencing platforms. So once your interview is scheduled and the credentials have been provided, you want to make sure your computer or device can access the platform. You also want to make sure your internet connection is reliable. Even the best connections sometimes drop. So if that should happen, you want to make sure you have the phone number handy in case you need to call in really quickly because the interview dropped. Also, I suggest you do a dry run and record it. You're always going to perform better prepared. So if you could do like a mock virtual interview with a friend, maybe you can record it and you can look for places where you can actually improve. And lastly, remember your interviewers can see what you can see. So it's critical to look directly at the camera of your, not the person on the screen. So you want to look right into the camera because that's the only way that you can ensure you're making eye contact. You also want to be conscious of your body language. You want to sit straight, keep your arms and hands relaxed, and speak in a calm, professional manner. Slouching, taking too long to answer questions, or speaking quickly allows interviewers to know that you are just A, not that interested, or B, way too nervous. You also want to sit no more than 20 inches from your screen. And you kind of want to make sure your light is adequate, the space around you is organized, see what's on the wall behind you. All of these factors matter. You probably don't want like a heavy metal poster on the wall behind you if you're going to do an interview. Next, you should treat your virtual interview like an in-person interview. So what does that mean? That means you should wear a professional attire, just as you would dress if you were walking through the company's physical doors. You should project a business-like atmosphere, choosing a well-lit room with light, or put a lamp behind your computer to make sure that your face is well-lit and you're not in the dark. You want to eliminate the sources of noise and distraction by turning off cell phones, music, and televisions. If you're interviewing from home, you want to let others in the household know that you shouldn't be disturbed during this time. And you should plan to put pets in a separate area. 
Next, let your personality show. This is of significant value when employers are access, assessing cultural fit and may be one of the biggest deciding factors that move you to the next round. Employers know that we can train someone on skills, but we, can't, we cannot train someone on personality. So let yours shine for sure. You should also keep a glass of water handy, but out of camera view, it's always better to be prepared. And it's okay to have a pad of paper handy to jot down notes or anything that the employer might ask you as a follow-up. But take your notes sparingly. Keep your eyes on the camera as much as possible. Next, you want to review and anticipate questions. You want to make a list of the questions that you would expect to hear during the interview and formulate your answers. So where do you find those questions? Well, those questions can be found pretty much anywhere online. Um, you could also talk to your recruiter and ask them if they could suggest a current employee that might be a good resource for you to reach out to. You should keep your answers concise, but clear and detailed, but make sure you don't memorize them. Sometimes questions could be worded differently than you anticipate, and if it sounds like you're reading from a book, it's definitely not not the um, not the intent at all. I also suggest that you build a rapport with your interviewers. Establishing a rapport is important in any business relationship and it allows you to separate yourself from other candidates. So you can do this by being prepared to talk about a common interest. Maybe you can ask how your interviewer's experience has been with virtual interviewing. Maybe you can talk about sports or maybe a mutual sport that you played in college or something like that, or any other neutral topic you can find to connect on. It helps you stay in the interviewer's mind. So now you're here and you're in the middle of the interview. What should you do? Well, some practices that I recommend. First and foremost, you should be polite. This means to everyone. This means to your recruiter, this means to maybe the assistant that scheduled your interview. And lastly, of course, it, it, you should be polite to your interviewers. We talked a little bit about body language, but your posture is very important. Slouching makes you come across as somebody who might be lazy. If you have sort of mannerisms such as, I don't know, cracking your knuckles or tapping your feet or bouncing your knee or anything like that, you want to make sure you're not doing that during the because they come across as signs of being nervous. You wanna turn your cell phone off. Don't just put it on silent because that can be distracting. Um, you also want to be authentic. You wanna show your best side, but don't pretend to be somebody or something that you're not. You also wanna to try to match the communication style of your interviewer. So if your interview if your interviewer's style is informal, then it's okay to relax a little. If your interviewer's style is really formal and really businesslike, then you want to be prepared and, and answer your questions the same way. Needless to say, if, you, if they're asking you direct questions, you need to be prepared to answer them. But you should also be prepared to ask insightful questions yourself. Interviewers tend to remember the candidates who pose challenging questions to them. And always refrain from asking questions about salary or other benefits. These are meant to be asked during the interview during the offer stage only. Because you don't want your interviewer to think your sole interest in the position is about compensation. So what should you not do on a job interview? Well, you definitely don't want to speak ill of past employers or past jobs. Your interviewers will ask questions about your past positions and why you left. Always answer in the most positive way possible. You also don't want to talk too much. Don't talk too much or take too long to answer a question. This gives your interviewers the impression that you have trouble getting to the point. You also don't want to display impatience. Even if your interviewers are running late, making your impatience known will not earn you any points. 
And lastly, don't forget to send a thank you note to each person that you met with. And then I added some um, illustrations here, some pictures here, graphics of things that you know you also shouldn't do. I mean, I'm sure we're all guilty of, you know, sort of, especially in the virtual environment, sometimes just dressing from the waist up. And while that might work for everyday work or things like that, I wouldn't suggest it for an interview. Um, the worst thing that could possibly happen is that you don't realize that your camera is catching all of you, and that would be pretty bad. Um, also, you know, as we said, if you're, if you're interviewing from your home, you want to be in a place where you won't be disturbed. The last thing you want is for, uh, you know, a younger brother or sister or a child or a pet to come running through barking and screaming or something like that. And then lastly, um, you know, you don't want to sound like you're reading from a script, for sure. And that does it for me. And I'm wondering if anyone has any questions. I don't see any questions um, in the chat, Linda. If you don't mind just hanging around maybe about two or three more minutes just in case someone does drop any questions, um, that way you can answer those in the chat for us. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much. And thank you to PFM for allowing you to participate today. Sure, and I'll stop sharing now. Thank you. Okay. All right, guys, again, if you're a business communications lab student, be sure to take a screenshot um, of the presentation so that way you'll be able to upload those into your um, iCollege tab. And then also um, make sure you guys are taking notes because Linda just shared some really helpful inf information about interviewing tips. And um, uh, all of the presentations today are going to be really, really helpful for you, okay? This is for your professional development, and we want to um, provide that for you, and we appreciate all of our employers for participating. Now we have Allison and Jackie from Cigna. They're going to be talking to you guys about virtual networking. And Jackie, I'm going to make you co-host co so you can share your screen. Uh, sure. Awesome. Give me one second. Good morning, everyone. All right, I'm hitting share now. Perfect, we can see it. All right. <laughs> All right, so I am joined with my colleague Allison on the line. Good morning, everyone. Um, her and I work for Cigna, um, and I am based as work from home. I've been work from home since um, September of last year, so I was actually work from home before the pandemic hit. Um, so I had a little competitive edge, I think, on, on being comfortable working from home. Um, and like I mentioned, Allison is joining me. <clears throat> Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Allison Eastwood. I, I'm Jackie's colleague. I actually usually sit in our corporate headquarters in Hartford, Connecticut. And um, right now I am working from home due to COVID, but I'm only three and a half miles away from the office. So once we're back um, and able to go in, I will be back at my desk. Great, happy to be here. So um, why I, you know, I wanted Jackie and I to share where we are because part of connecting and being a part of a team and networking, um, just sharing with all of you that we don't work in the same office. Um, a lot of our team doesn't even work in our offices or, you know, a lot of people work from home, different offices throughout the United States. So being able to connect, build relationships, um, be our authentic selves at work, and again, build those networks to do our jobs, that's really important. So just two of us on our team, just an example of how we've been, what, co-workers for two years now, Jackie, mm -hmm. we have a really strong relationship, and um, we're going to walk through some things about, that will help um, identify really great ways for you to connect and build relationships um, and, you know, network at work. So we're going to review connecting, relationship building, and authenticity. So... One thing that I think that people sometimes, and I don't see a lot of faces on the video today, which is okay, but communicating face-to-face -face is super important. I really believe that. So sitting in Connecticut, I'm fortunate where there's about 4,000 people I can walk in and see every day. At the same time, my team, like I said, is all over the United States. So we are very often on video. Um, on a chat or, you know, talking to each other on the phone. It's not all about instant messaging or 
sending an email. So be able to communicate as soon as you can face to face um, and in person to help, you know, that's help build relationship and rapport and networking. Um, the other thing is getting to know people. So sometimes Jackie and I, we do have a lot on our agendas when we're working together, but we we definitely have lives and interests and, you know, both of us have the children. So, you know, take a minute to recognize and connect a little bit. It's not all about work, work, work sometimes. So one way to just get to know a colleague or somebody when you're building your network is spend a moment um, and connect with them. Ask the question, how's everything going? How was your weekend? Um, you know, the weather is always a hot topic, but also think of a lot of other things. So start when you're early on as an intern or even as a you know full-time employee, start to build that rapport to get to know people. And Jackie is not in the office, um, but I am. So, you know, water cooler talk is but commonly known as when people, you know, go to get your water, you walk down to the cafeteria together and you physically get to see people and have like the out of work conversation. So when you are a work at home employee, we're all in this COVID environment working from home, you might have to go at the extra mile um, to make those connections. Jackie, you want to give just an example of how you do that? Yeah, so there are certain members of my team that I never interact with in meetings because our paths just don't cross. And so I intentionally make sure that we have a 30 minute check point checkpoint biweekly just to talk. Um, sometimes it's about brainstorming projects and work related ideas. Sometimes it's just to catch up on life and to remind ourselves that we feel connected with each other. But you intentionally have to create that water cooler talk and make the time for your colleagues. So that first of all, it puts yourself out there. So they remember that you're an active member of the team. Um, but also it's again to build those deeper relationships so people feel like they have a rapport and, and a relationship with you. And one other thing that you can do, so there's your team, right, your immediate team that you're connected to, and then there's the greater organization that you're a part of. At Cigna, and I know a lot of other companies have these too, um, they could be called different things like colleague resource groups. At Cigna, they're called employee resource groups. But they are such a great way to connect with maybe um, a personal interest of yours or something you want to, to be a part of. So example, I'm a part of the women networking group at Cigna, so Women at Work Networking. And that is just one way I'm meeting a lot of other professional women at Cigna outside of my team. So we connect on different professional development topics. We have um, a book club. There's a lot of other things we do. And then we also connect with other employee resource groups. So that is one way for you to get usually involved in your company, as well as network and connect with others. Um, and, and the one thing, you know, we have here defining common metrics for success. So making sure that when you're, you know, at work and working with your team that you understand what are the goals of the team. So, you know, you're all working on the same page together towards the same larger goal. So making sure that that's, you know, the direction you're heading um, as an employee when you're networking and um, you know, kind of measuring your success and what you're kind of getting involved with and how you're connecting and who you're connecting with. I'll jump in here on the next slide. So um, these tips are transferable for whether you have a virtual internship, um, whether you have an in-person uh, internship or job, um, or just, you know, networking in general as you're looking for internships and jobs. But first of all is find your communities. Um, there are online blog groups, um, whether it's within your company on LinkedIn, um, online communities that you can get involved in to start um, sharing information with each other and learning best practices practices from each other. Uh, and it's a, a great resource for you to find individuals that have the same passion points um, and maybe even work for the same organizations that you're interested in. We also recommend virtual coffees and lunches um, and virtual happy hours, you know, just opportunities to informally connect. It's great if you reach out to someone who you're trying to get to know more, maybe they're in a position that you are seeking out and you can say, hey, could we set up, you know, 30 minutes for a virtual coffee? I'd love to learn more about you. Um, 
and uh, you know learn about the role that you have at the company that you're in because I am an alumni from your university, whatever it is, but reaching out and setting up that time um, with individuals as well as at work, um, even though you can't go down to the cafe together like you might have been used to, setting up time to have lunch all together. Um, our team actually just did that last week because we had a new team, mem team member join. Um, we all just got on a WebEx meeting together and had lunch together and it was really nice um, for connecting. We also recommend having a buddy or a mentor. A buddy is more of an informal person that's your go-to for those day-to-day -day questions that you might not want to bog your um, manager with, and you can just go to that buddy who's a, a trusted person that uh, might have worked for a company a little bit longer for you. And a mentor is obviously someone that you seek as a professional and can, can give you real guidance and feedback, sometimes critical feedback that um, you know you have to be receptive to, but those are great resources resources to keep you on track and, and um, keep you connected and, and moving forward professionally and personally. We also recommend doing exercise challenges, um, especially work from home. It's hard to keep moving. Um, so doing, you know, an exercise challenge either with your company or with your friends is really good. For after work events, if you're invited to an after work happy hour or a dinner event um, virtually or in person, um, again, it's good to go to those things. Even um, if you don't plan to drink, that's perfectly fine. It's all about relationship building. And then there are opportunities to volunteer and get connected with groups that are doing virtual volunteering, such as um, tutoring or uh, writing cards to um, people that are elderly and are you know, stuck by themselves right now. There's opportunities there. And then this photo was actually when my team um, sang happy birthday to me on a happy hour back in May. And that's all their photos on the top. I stole this from um, LinkedIn. Next, we have relationship building, which is obviously critical to networking. It's about the relationship. It's not just about um, the ask that you have of someone. So what I always recommend is that when you go to someone, uh, the first thing you should think to yourself is how can I help this person? How can I be of value to them? So it's not a one-way relationship to where I'm just trying to get something out of them. Um, so think about your value and you know, why that person might want to connect with you personally. We also recommend that you make your interactions meaningful um, and have difficult conversations when they need to be had so that you can get over barriers and not just feel passive or aggression towards someone because maybe it's been difficult to work with them. Confront difficult conversations if you're struggling with topics or um, projects that you're working on, confront those up front, make them meaningful, constructive, and be able to move past those. You also wanna make sure that you're personal and not just always having an ask of someone. Um, don't be there to only reach out to someone when you need something from them. You should have relationships with people so that when you do need something from them, it's more comfortable and casual for you to approach them. Um, listening, we'll talk about this a little bit more on the next slide. Sending thank you notes when someone helps you and also just thank you as a way to um, acknowledge that you've uh, read something or received information. Um, don't just leave it, you know, get receive an email and just leave it as is always say thank you or got it thanks um after someone sends you something and then we have on here recognize the appropriate time to leave a happy hour and sometimes the appropriate time means to stay a little bit longer because that's when things turn to tend to turn into a little bit more casual where you can build relationships but again you don't have to drink um, in order to network uh, or to build relationships you can just be present and be social uh, and focus on getting to know your colleagues and um, whoever you're you're networking with i'll pass it back to allison for this last slide here thanks so you know, the speaker before us used the word authentic, and this is 100% true. Be honest and be real with who you are. So people can support you when they when they really know you. So I think it's, it's definitely a way to get to know people, to make connections. Um, so let people know who you are. It helps, you know, make the connection, sharing your background really giving getting to know people and them getting to know you to help. So you know, you can be a, a real work colleague friend. So it's, it's important to be honest and be real with who you are. Um, and like Jackie said, be a good listener. So as a future intern or a future new employee, um, you're, you're going to walk into a place where maybe you've learned a limited bit of information because that's how, you know, kind of got the jobs. You kind of know the organization a bit, but 
listen. Listen to what, listen and learn. So be a good listener. Be open to feedback that you're going to get from people. Take notes, um, process things, you know, really listen and, and, you know, make the eye contact and really be a part of the conversation as a listener. Um, I think that sometimes, you know, Jackie and I were talking about this where you can tell when somebody is like not listening and like, mm -hmm, let's get to the point because you're so quick to want to respond back. So take a minute and take a step back and definitely listen. It helps build, um, you know, a great relationship with somebody as well. And then as I always tell interns this, be proactive and take initiative. So you're going to get your first job, like you're going to get your tasks and you're going to understand what your job is. You might get your internship, summer internship project. Um, but, you know, be proactive as, remember, as the active listener, take initiative. So if you hear something and you think it might relate to the project or work you're doing, are you, can you make those, can you connect the dots and maybe add something additional to your project or your work? So be that person that takes initiative, you know, and it's another way to help connect and I'll also help you grow your career. That is and the last slide that Jackie? I had. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I was just going to say we'll be, we'll stay on the um, call and we'll man any questions in the chat. Um, and I'll also put um, my email address in the chat too, which you all are um, welcome to reach out to us if you have any questions or want a copy of this slide after. Thank you guys, that was awesome. I hope that all the students got a lot of value from your presentation. Um, you guys shared some very important information and um, we really appreciate you guys joining us today. So um, we're gonna give you a virtual round of applause <laughs> for doing an awesome nice. job guys. Thank you again. And like they said, I think Allison just put her email in the chat, so did Jackie. And all they put clap, clap, awesome. <laughs> okay, they're gonna stick around um, for the next five minutes or so to answer any questions you guys have in the chat. But right now I'm excited to introduce Mallory. Mallory is uh, gonna talk to you guys about professional attire. Thank you so much, Mallory. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Mallory Powell. I am the campus recruiting manager for Vector Marketing. I'm gonna put my contact information in the chat in case any of you want to reach out to me after this presentation. Um, Vector Marketing offers part-time work to students um, to work around your classes doing one-on-one -on -one virtual presentations showing our products, which is Cutco Cutlery. So we've had a, a lot of experience over the past couple of years doing virtual presentations and learning what some of the best practices are for these virtual presentations and how they might actually work. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the actual presentation and doing these presentations virtually, which is something that you might not have been necessarily familiar with um, in the past. You know, this is pretty new. Everyone's really done them in the classroom in the past. So when you are the one that's presenting, um, you want to make sure that you're keeping your audience engaged. And that looks a little different when you're doing it virtually. You wanna make sure that you're utilizing polls, um, utilizing the chat like you guys have been doing. You've been doing awesome, good job. Um, also doing uh, Q and A, question and answer in the chat at the end of your presentation is always really important as well. That way you're keeping the audience engaged and making sure you're having those natural interactions that you would if it were an in-person opportunity. Also, as an audience member and a participant, making sure that you're interacting with your presenter is really important. Closing all the windows on your computer, uh, putting your phone away, making sure that you turn off your cell cue. This is one that I just learned, and it's especially easy to do on Zoom. Um, it's very natural for us to look at ourselves and just be uh, you know, worried about what other people are seeing. So you have the option to turn off your cell view on Zoom. So when you're presenting, I find that especially helpful so that you're not constantly looking at your picture on the screen. You can look at your camera or look at your participants. Um, also, never ever eat in any, I, I don't like it as a audience member or obviously not as a presenter, um, eating and drinking while you're you know, presenting is never ever professional and doesn't uh, bode well in a presentation. 
Um, as an audience member, if it's during a lunch time, I would just recommend turning your camera off. In terms of attire, um, you always want to think about how you're presenting yourself. Um, if you are the presenter or if you are in an interview situation, um, it's always my recommendation to dress in a business attire. Um, and that may look like wearing a jacket, wearing a tie. Um, and I recommend head to toe business attire, just like you would if you were in person. Um, it just puts you in the right headspace. And like Linda mentioned before, you never know if you're gonna have to stand up for some reason, or um, if your camera happens to be at a different angle than you are anticipating, you wanna make sure that you are dressed professionally from head to toe. So that includes your pants and your shoes um, for any interview or presentations that you might be doing. Um, in interviews, like I said, business professional is what I would always recommend. So jackets, ties, dress shirts, um, things of that nature, a nice business dress, that is always, always appropriate. If it's a presentation for a class um, or a business presentation, maybe for work, um, it depends on your work environment, whether you can be a little more business casual. Um, maybe you don't need a tie, maybe just a button up is appropriate, but you wanna make sure that you check with whoever you may be um, presenting to before you go into that situation to say, hey, is this gonna be you know, business or is it business casual? So that you are prepared before you go into that and know do I need a tie? Um, do I need a jacket? You don't want to be the only one in a um, situation that is not wearing that. Uh, the worst thing that, that you can do is be underdressed. It's, you can never be overdressed, but you can absolutely be underdressed. So you want to make sure that you communicate with everyone beforehand so that you know what the atti appropriate attire is for that presentation um, that you're doing. In an interview, I always recommend business, but in a presentation, it can be business casual. And a lot of what this also brings into your um, attire is your, your camera and your angle, um, making sure that you are presenting yourself well, not only with your attire, but making sure that you can be seen well um, and that your attire uh, isn't overshadowed by the things that are around you. So making sure that your camera is eye level. Um, it is so distracting if you are looking down onto a camera or if it's super high up um, and you look like you're looking up. That is, it, it just never comes across as professional. Your lighting is so huge. Um, you know, if you put together this great business outfit but you have horrible lighting, um, then it's going to counteract all of your effort to look nice that day. So you want to make sure that you are in a well-lit room uh, with the light in front of you. You never want to sit in front of a window, um, like Linda said earlier. That is just, uh, it never looks good. You're, you become a shadow um, in your camera, so you don't want that. Uh, just as important as what you're wearing is your background. You want to make sure that you have a clean background. Um, you, we have virtual backgrounds as options on Zoom and many other virtual platforms. Um, some of them also have the option where you can blur your background. I believe that's on uh, Microsoft Teams. And that's a great thing to utilize as well. Nobody is expecting you to have a home office, especially as a student is in an interview situation. But you definitely want to make sure that your background is clean and professional um, so that it doesn't overshadow your efforts to look nice and professional. Um, and you want to make sure that you're communicating with your housemates um, on, your on what your schedule is so that they know, hey, I'm going to be doing a presentation or I'm going to be in an interview from this time to this time please make sure that you are 
uh, respectful of my time, don't walk into the room, try not to be too loud. Um, you want to make sure that everyone in your house is aware so that you don't have anyone uh, breaking through the, the door and into the camera angle. Um, so like I said, those are all of the things that I highly recommend, but your business attire especially um, is, is going to be what's going to set you up for success and put you in the right mindset to do a successful interview or presentation. Awesome. Thank you, Mallory. Does anybody have any questions about professional attire for Mallory? You could come off mute and ask your questions or drop them in the chat. I'll stick around so that if you have any questions. Okay. I think we have a few more minutes, so we want to use that time. Um, guys, do you guys have any questions about attire? Um, what is considered professional? Um, Okay, someone just asked Mallory, they said, are jeans and a blazer business casual? I, I never <laughs> like to wear jeans to a, a business function. Um, yeah, it, it's okay, I think if it's like a happy hour or an after work situation, I think then jeans and a blazer are fine. But if it's part of the meeting, I never recommend jeans um, just because they can come across very casual unless they're like really nice jeans. So I, I always like to steer clear, stick with, you know, khakis or dress pants. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I have a question for you. How do you feel about makeup for women? So if it's something that you wear every day, I, I would recommend it, but um, if it's not something that you're into, it, I, you don't feel like you need to not be yourself. I want you to be your authentic self um, and be, you know, put together. Um, you, obviously, you don't want your hair and makeup to be totally crazy. You want to look like you, you know, washed your face that morning, brushed your hair, um, or did your hair. Um, but if I don't feel that you'd have to put on makeup if it's not something that you typically do. Awesome. Um, we do have a few more questions. Um, what is an example of business casual and what is strictly considered business attire? So business attire is, you know, a full suit jacket tie. Um, for women, it may be a button down, a, a dress uh, jacket. Um, and casual, you don't necessarily have to wear a tie. You don't necessarily have to wear a jacket. Um, it can just be a button down with khakis or dress pants. Okay, there's another question. What hairstyles are considered business professional? Um, I think that depends on your style, really. And as long as you look like you brushed your hair or put your hair back um, or did your hair that day, I think that is professional. Um, it, you you want to make it look like you actually put some effort into your presentation and how you look that day. If you roll out of bed and your hair is going all different directions, that is not going to be considered uh, appropriate. There's another question. Should you wear a blazer, and I'm guessing this is for women, um, if you if your dress is sleeveless? Depending on where you are in the country, um, I totally understand if you are, you know, in the South in the summer, it's super hot. In those cases, I've been at conferences and you don't have to wear a jacket. It's, it means that you're going to be sweating and dying in this meeting. But um, in any situation where you can comfortably wear the jacket, I would recommend it. And then it, I think if there's a happy hour or something afterwards, it's totally appropriate to take the jacket off for that portion. Awesome. Uh, here's another question. So for if you're in an in-person uh, interview or networking environment, how about cologne or, um, or perfumes? I, you can absolutely wear it. Make sure that you don't overdo it though. Um, I, I haven't seen that a lot with our generation. I think that 
uh, the older generation, I've seen that more. They they might be don't smell it or they're too used to it. Um, but yeah, be be careful not to overdo it. And maybe before you leave the house, ask someone um, that you live with, like, is this too strong? Um, yeah, but I, I recommend if you wear it on a typical basis. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Right. I agree. You don't want to make it too strong because people have allergies and you don't know what people are allergic to. Um, we have another question in the chat. Should ladies always wear heels or are flats sometime appropriate? No, I think flats are, can be appropriate as well. Um, especially if you're going to like a conference and you're walking around a lot, heels, you're going to be dying by the end of the day. So, um, going into the situation, engaging how much you're actually going to be on your feet. Um, you can absolutely wear flats. Um, I'd rather you wear flats than have to take your shoes off halfway through the day and then you're carrying around your heels. That I don't find uh, business appropriate at all. Right. We've got one more question and then we're going to um, go ahead and transition to our next speaker. But the last question is, and it's so cute, what type of event has a happy hour afterwards and what exactly is happy hour? So um, any networking events or conferences or meetings that you go to, a lot of times at the end of the day, they have a little hour or two for networking and um, they will serve drinks and food for everyone. And it's a more casual environment where you can talk and connect with the people that were in that meeting um, and or in your class in some cases. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mallory. Oh, Al I think Allison wants to chime in on that one. Hold on. I think you're muted, Allison. We can't hear you. Uh, I just, yeah, yeah, I'm good. I just wanted to share that some interviews in the interview process, I know that everything is virtual right now, but sometimes in an interview process, there are final rounds where they invite you ahead of time mm -hmm. and there could be a networking portion. So that could be considered a happy hour type environment. So you could have dinner and maybe there's drinks, but it's kind of a happy hour situation the day before an interview. Um, we happen to have that at Cigna. I know a lot of other companies do that too. So just remember, even in the interview process, um, that could be a part of you know, the happy hours could be a part of the interviewing, as well as as an intern, if you're invited to events at night in a happy hour situation, remember, you're an intern. I'll, I always, you know, think about what you're, you're drinking or not drinking. Um, you don't have to stay all night and be the, you never want to be the last one in happy hour. No, no, you never want to be the last one. No. So make your decisions. You don't have to stay forever, but, you know, thank you for letting me share that. But it's important to remember that could be a part of the process, too. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, ladies. Sure. Thank you so much, Mallory. We appreciate you from Vector um, for sharing so much uh, information about a professional attire, explaining exactly what a happy hour is. And even Allison um, chimed in on that one because that's very important and a lot of students don't know that information. So thank you again. We appreciate you. Um, Mallory's going to stick around for like the next five minutes to show or so and just kind of look at the chat to see if you have any more questions. But I'm excited to present our next presenter. We have Matthew Needleman and he's going to be talking about um, virtual interview tech tips because a lot of you guys have questions about technology and making sure your audio and video works and he's going to tell you exactly what you need to do in order to be successful. So Matthew, I've made you co-host so you should be good to go. Excellent. Hello everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I'm about to share my screen here. I do have a few slides. I'm excited to talk about this. Uh, this is something I think about a lot over the past few months. My name is Matt Needleman. I work for a company in Midtown called PatientCo, which is a payments software for hospitals. And uh, I'm the recruiter, talent acquisition manager. I put my title up here. Um, I thought that'd be helpful. Okay, so today we're talking about avoiding distractions and tech tips during the virtual interviews. You know, PatientCo, like many companies, uh, if not all companies, we're conducting 100% of our interviews now for the roles that we're hiring for now. Uh, virtually. So over video, we specifically use Zoom. This will be the case for us at least until the end of the year, if not into 2021. So I created a training internally for um, hiring managers and interviewers at PatientCo. 
And so I wanted to bring some of the stuff that I researched and learned to you today. So this is really, it's all about how to bring focus to the virtual interview. It's actually gonna be a little bit of overlap with what Mallory was just talking about in terms of backgrounds and things like that. But we're also gonna uh, focus on some tech tips and really how to avoid any glitches and things that can happen. So the reason why we created a guide is because during an interview, there's just so many things that you're, you're looking to accomplish. You really want to create connection with the people that, are, that you're interviewing with and really in person interviews. Um, those tend to foster a stronger bond and they just make it easier to endear yourself to the people that you're interviewing with you're in person after all. And so you're able to create a bit of a stronger impression, a bit of a stronger bond. Um, there's less there's less things blocking you from the interviewer. Um, a lot of times interview processes are the, we, the company, we, the interviewers, we use them as a way to assess collaboration. So a lot of our interviews at Patient Co actually mimic what a working session would look like between us and the person we're interviewing. Um, we're really getting a feel for what it's going to be like to work with this person. And so over video, there's just more challenges to, to establish that. Obviously, we'll talk about the technical risks. Um, you know, there's the obstacles of potentially having poor sound quality, distractions, unexpected circumstances of where you're at, things like that we'll talk about. Exactly. And then, uh, like, your wife coming into the picture, Hi, asking for the keys, yep. which okay. I don't have on me. They're upstairs somewhere. Okay. Bye. Case in point. And then you got to just bounce right back. Okay. And then giving them a read on you. You might be less comfortable over video than you are in person. Eye contact is different, facial cues are less apparent, and so things need to be structured um, for your home video setup to make sure that you're adjusting for those things. So bringing focus to the interview, we're gonna, I'm gonna just you know, focus on three areas, audio, visual, audio, video, your setting, which is what kind of overlaps with what Manly was talking about before, and then posture, and posture is just is way more than sitting up straight, we'll talk about what that means as well. So uh, let's start with the audio video. So there's a lot here that um, people just assume, turn on the video and go. So it definitely takes a little bit more curation than all that. Um, I personally, once we started working from home, I had to move into my unfinished basement, which you can't see because I have this great green screen behind me. But um, I knew that my basement would be far away from the Wi-Fi and that would cause a lot of connectivity issues. So what I did was I drilled a hole in my floor upstairs um, and I ran a 70 Wi-Fi cable down through, in, you know, through the hole in the floor, through my entire basement, right over here to my computer, so that I'd be hardwired in with Ethernet. Because I didn't want to leave it to chance that the Wi-Fi might go out, or that I would have bad Wi-Fi, or if my kids were, had, had to be home and were on Zoom school, that that would affect the bandwidth. So I, I hardwired in through the Ethernet. Testing audio. So audio is a big deal. Um, the, the thing that I want everyone to walk away with is that Audio is 70% of video. Audio is so much more important uh, during your virtual interviews than video ever will be. So if you ever have to sacrifice due to bandwidth, turn the video off and last case scenario, you, you know, you'll end up going to the phone, but the audio is so much more important, which is why I sacrifice style points to have this um, pretty cool headset so that I have an external mic. So test your audio with somebody else before the interview. If possible, use, use a external microphone so that the audio is really crisp and clear. People who are using uh, Macs, the Mac computers, I've noticed their built-in microphone is oftentimes better than perhaps a PC, like well, I have a Dell, so I know that the microphone's not great. You really want to spend some time and even spend some money making sure that you have good audio. Uh, you know, you don't want any echoes. You don't want it to be fuzzy. You want it to be really clear. That's going to, it's going to make or break the interview, I promise you that. Um, Speaking of audio, so when, you know, if the interviewer should have a glitch or if their audio is bad, you really want to make sure that you're understanding what they're asking you and what they're saying. So interrupt them. Ask the interviewer to repeat what they said. Make sure that you're really clear on what they're looking for from your answer because you don't want to answer something that you thought they said and then it was wrong. That leaves a bad impression and the, interview gets, the interviewer gets a feel that you didn't really answer the question, you didn't understand what they were asking, interrupt them, make sure that they repeat what they, what they were saying. This is another thing that I'm, I'm really um, keen on. I really think it's crucial to turn off self view. So you'll, you know, in the Zoom settings, or if you're using a different platform, you have to find out what those settings are. I've really only ever used Zoom. Um, make sure that you turn off self view so that you're not distracted by 
the beautiful image of your face off to the right or wherever it is, and you're not constantly like checking yourself out, making sure that you're like looking good, focus on them. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how to focus on them, but, but get rid of your own kind of image so that you're not, um, you're not distracted by yourself. So settings, so this, is, this is the part that kind of overlaps with what Mally was talking about. You know, get comfortable in a quiet room. Make sure that you're gonna have as few interruptions as possible. We're talking about pets, kids, roommates, family members. Um, the big thing about that is, um, I'll jump down to the third bullet. Tell the interviewer about what's going on. If you live in a building and they're doing la landscaping work outside, if there's loud trucks and construction, tell them, normalize all of the sounds and things that might happen during the interview so that it's part of the context. Now it's just part of the interviewer interview and the interviewer knows that this is gonna happen, it's outside of your control and it's, it's gonna be way less of a distraction for them if you were to just normalize it and say, by the way, um, my dog right now is barking or whatever it is and do the best you can. Use a virtual background or a generic background with good lighting like Mal Mallory said before. Turn off your phone um, or at least put it on silent and close all other tabs that you might have open on your on your computer, on your screen. If you have a couple screens, you know, turn all tabs off. Try to silence all notifications, you know, kind of base level stuff for getting ready for the for the interview. Posture, this is also something that was mentioned before. You know, you really want your camera to be at eye level. A lot of the computer, a lot of the laptops these days have the camera at the bottom and it creates this upward angle, which is just less desirable because the idea here is that any little thing at all that the interviewer notices or sees that can seem any bit askew or weird at all will take away from the experience of interviewing you. So you want it to be as much as possible as if you're in the same room. So you want it eye level, there's a, there's a two thirds kind of rule in photography so that like if you divide this height into three, so you have a third here and a third here. So you want your eyes to be at that third as close as possible. That's kind of the rule. And it's just, there's nothing startling about that. So they'll be able to focus on you and what you're saying. So maintaining eye contact, I have another slide for this. Maintaining eye contact is obviously very strange over video because you're either gonna be looking at their face, wherever it is, you're most likely not gonna be looking into the camera. So the trick for this is as follows. When, you, when you're on Zoom, and let's say you have a Google Doc that you're taking notes for the interview or you're typing something after the interview, whatever, whatever it is you have behind. When you're on Zoom, when you minimize Zoom, it creates this mini window. I'm looking at a mini window myself right now. You wanna move that mini window right next to the camera. So if your camera's at the top, like, like this uh, exhibit, if your camera's at the top of the screen like mine is, you wanna move that mini window to right underneath the camera. Um, if you're, and if your camera's obviously at the bottom, you wanna move the mini window to the bottom so that you're looking, that you're looking down. Um, you really wanna do whatever you can to make it look like you're talking straight to the person. And you know we have to do tricks to accomplish this because virtual interviewing is, is strange. That's all it is. Um, so this is a big tip that I like. Um, you know, again, you wanna shrink that, that window down from Zoom so that the person's face is right next to your camera so you can look at them and be looking at the camera at the same time. So a quick review, you know, you really want that camera eye level, do whatever you can to do that. Put it on a stack of books, um, make it happen. Interrupt the interviewer, tell them you didn't hear exactly what they said and it's awkward to do that, but do that and go through the extra effort that it takes to do that so that you, um, so that, you know, you're really getting a good idea of, of what they want to know from you. Um, hardwire that bad boy in there. You know, you really want to mitigate all risks with Wi-Fi as much as possible and then close all those tabs. You just want absolutely nothing else happening in the background of your, of your focus, of your attention, so that you really are mimicking what it's like. Uh, in the room with being in the room with the person. Um, so that's basically it. I did put together a, a, like a one page PDF for candidates that interview with, uh, you know, for patient care. I send it to them before the interview. So they have like a quick one sheet guidelines about, you know, virtual interviewing. If anyone's interested in having that, I'm happy to email it out. Um, if there's an email going out from, from GSU after this, I'm happy to include it in that if possible or whatever, whatever I can do. Thank you so much, Matt. We really appreciate that. I'm going to put the Robinson um, CAC email um, in here so that way if students do want that PDF, they can definitely access it. RCBCAC at gsu.edu. Okay, guys, do you have any questions for Matt um, about uh, anything tech related, questions about interviewing, 
Um, you can come off mute or you can drop those questions in the chat. We have about two more minutes before we're going to give you guys a quick break. And then we have some representatives from State Farm, Rocket IT, Sloan. They're going to be talking to you guys, just giving an overall virtual interviewing panel. So be prepared. We have some questions prepared, but if you have some more questions, we'll be happy to address those as well. I like that backdrop, Matthew. Thanks, I put that together right before. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Guys, anybody have any questions for Matt before we let him go? And if you want to put your contact information in the chat, Matt, that would be great. Yep. If you want to follow up with you um, or ask anything about patient code, that would be awesome. Pleasure. Thank you, thank you. All right, guys, we appreciate you being attentive. Um, oh, I do see a question just came in. Um, is it better to use a desktop or a laptop? Um, so I don't think there's any difference between the actual computer that you use. It's all about where the camera is. Like I got an external camera because I didn't like the camera for my computer. You know, with a desktop, you definitely have to do that. Um, so it doesn't really matter which computer. It's all about the positioning of the camera. That's the most important part. I think. Awesome. Uh, here's a plug. Uh, is Patient Code doing interviews soon? <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> Yeah we, we, yeah, we just started hiring for um, customer support, uh, some operations, and engineering. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So, guys, Matt just put his information down. Um, yeah, so you, can you, to, um, you can go to patientcolife.com. Put that in the chat as well uh, for us, Matt. .com, I think slash careers. Awesome. Slash careers. So, guys, that's and... where you go to apply. And then you'll find our uh, open listings right now. Yes. So don't email Matt to apply for the job, guys. Go to patient yeah, patientforlife.com. <laughs> yeah, I look at every I, I look at every application. So awesome, awesome. So he'll see your applications, guys. Awesome. Yeah. So um, we appreciate you, Matt. Um, guys, we're gonna take a um, we're gonna take about a three minute break. So go grab some water, um, use the restroom, grab a snack um, because you don't wanna miss this panel. Again, we have uh, representatives from State Farm, Rocket IT and Sloan, and they're gonna drop a lot of value for you guys about just virtual uh, communication and virtual networking um, in general. And you'll be able to ask them questions as well. And we have some questions prepared. So um, if you can be back here right at like 12.03 ish, um, so that way we can get started. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Lakeisha, is that you with undergrad CAC? I'm just curious. Or is that Marielle? It's me. I'm not actually about to log off for a quick second. Aaliyah. Okay. Okay, I just saw Lakeisha uh, typing in the chat that she was on her way, and I didn't know if she was here yet. If not, then I'll move forward. Okay, cool. Guys, we're going to give everyone about one more minute to get back before we get started. Um, and I do see we have all of our panelists here. So um, if you guys, panelists, if you guys can go ahead and turn your camera on so that way um, 
I'll know that you guys, like, I see Jordan. Awesome. Thanks, Jordan. Um, Colleen, and I'm looking for Edgar. Edgar. I saw you on Edgar. Let's see. I just saw you show up, Edgar. So you're here. Yes, I'm here. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, and guys, if you want to put your cameras on speaker view, so that way you'll be able to see all of the panelists as they um, as they come off mute, that would be awesome. So then it will make sense that we are in a panel. <laughs> If you are a BCom, a Business Communications Lab student, um, be sure to take a screenshot of the panel um, so that way you will receive credit. If you've already taken your screenshot, that's fine, but I do know we have people who hop on and hop off who may not have heard when to take the screenshot. So you wanna take the screenshot during the panel discussion so that way you can receive BCom um, credit, guys. So, um, and you're gonna drop that into your Dropbox on the iCollege tab. Um, for this particular uh, CAC event. So um, we're gonna give them one more minute to get here and we're gonna go ahead and get started. I see Lakeisha's on. Lakeisha, do you wanna um, turn your camera on so that way the students can see you and speak review? you? All right, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists. Um, we have Edgar Butler from State Farm. Edgar has worked closely with the Career Advancement Center. Um, we're so excited to have him. I'm sure he's going to share a lot with you guys. We have Colleen Frangos from Rocket IT. So all my CIS majors, I know you're going to be looking for Colleen's contact information. And if you guys could drop your contact information if you want to or your career site um, in the chat box, feel free to do so. And we have Jordan Reamer from Salome, and uh, again, my, I know my CIS students are gonna be asking you a lot of questions as well, but we're here to help all of you guys. Um, I'm sure that we have some questions that are already prepared, but if you have questions, feel free to drop those in the chat, and we are gonna get started in the with the panel. I'm just gonna make sure, if, see if Lakeisha um, is, can unmute herself. Um, and if not, we're gonna go ahead and move forward. Let me pull up the questions, guys. How's everybody doing today? Um, panelists, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you guys so that way you can um, introduce yourselves to the students so that way they'll know um, your positions and exactly how long you've been with your company. So starting with Jordan. Awesome, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Jordan Reamer and I work over at Solom. I've been uh, at Solom since January um, and I'm actually starting a new um, I guess practice area uh, or I guess new function within Solom. So I focus more on uh, project-based work um, rather than kind of consulting work, but, but happy to answer any questions you have about Solom. Awesome. Next, I see Colleen. Hey, hi everybody. I'm Colleen Frangos. I'm the Community Relationship Coordinator at Rocket IT. We are located in Swanee, Georgia, and we have been in business for 25 years providing IT support, security, and strategy for other businesses and organizations in the greater Atlanta area. I have been with the organization now for a year, and I serve as brand ambassador and lead recruiter. Awesome. And Edgar. Hello, everyone. Uh, glad to be here uh, connecting with the students again. Always a, a great time I have with connecting with the career services at Robinson College. So um, good to see you all. So I am a talent brand specialist with State Farm. I have been with State Farm now 12 years. Uh, and this is actually the eighth role that I've been in. And so I actually recruit for interns full time and part time for all different areas and different departments within State Farm from IT to accounting to actuary, uh, claims, underwriting, um, almost anything that you can really think of. So again, thanks for, for allowing me to be here. Thank you, Edgar. Thank you all for being here on the panel, Jordan, Colleen, and Edgar. Um, so here are, is, is our first question. Um, and it's more of a question. It's not actually on my question list, but I'm just curious. How did you guys um, just kind of adapt in your recruiting practices um, when COVID-19 hit and we were kind of forced 
to be in a virtual environment. I know some of you guys may have already had virtual, um, you know, uh, plans in that were already in effect. But, you know, just if anything kind of changed or um, how did your virtual recruiting efforts change during the pandemic or when the pandemic hit? I guess I'll, I'll start. So generally speaking, uh, I guess pre-COVID, I would meet my candidates out for coffee, out for lunch. Um, and now that I am not doing that, I kind of came, came up with kind of a creative way just to get to know the candidates or whoever was applying for the job. It's just said, hey, let's have a virtual meeting. Um, and at first kind of people were hesitant about it. Um, and I said it's the same thing if you and I were kind of meet from coffee. It's just kind of over over computer, over chat. Um, and so that's typically what I what I'm doing right now is I'm setting up meetings and then um, giving the candidate or whoever's applying uh, for the job the the opportunity to say um, yes, let's meet virtually or, or no, and then we just kind of go from there. Um. So kind of something similar, like I'm, I'm a relational person, right? So I, I love the, the the personal interaction with people. And so as much as I can get that, like that really um, energizes me. And so I really lead with setting up the virtual meetings. So we, we have WebEx um, throughout the, through the organization. And so my lead in really is if I'm setting up a meeting, I'm automatically going to say, okay, yeah, we can meet by WebEx. And I look for them to respond back. Maybe if they say they can't or, okay, I don't have that capability or can we do it by phone? But I'm going to really lead with that because I really want that face-to-face -face interaction. I want them to be able to see me and I want to be able to see them. And I think it makes for a more personal connection. And so most of my meetings right now, when I'm meeting with students or candidates, I'm always going to lead with uh, setting up a virtual WebEx meeting just so we can have that face-to-face -face time. Awesome. I would have to agree with Edgar. I, I think connecting um, in the face-to-face -face time, I think, is really a great opportunity um, to get to know someone and, and see that the facial expressions, get to know their mannerisms a little bit more. Uh, I think you get to know that whole person and see what's genuine and what's not. Uh, we at, at Rocket IT, I always start with a phone screen or a first round phone interview. Um, and based on how well that goes, we do a video chat and we like to use Microsoft Teams. Um, you don't necessarily have to have Microsoft Teams to be able to do a chat. It's, you can access it in your web browser, so it's super easy to use. Uh, but face-to-face, -face, despite being apart, um, you know, in a virtual environment, you, it's good to get the FaceTime and definitely take advantage of it. Awesome. I'm going to ask the big question that all students kind of want to know right now and just get your feedback on it. What is the best way for a student to show that they are engaged in a virtual meeting or interview? I can start with that. Uh, come prepared. I, I, I want to know that you've been to my website, you've looked at our Google reviews, you know what our company is about, you've looked at our LinkedIn profiles. I want to know that you have done your research. Uh, I, I think in our industry with IT, you've got people are lifelong learners. They're constantly pursuing different certifications um, in, in their related spot. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at people who want to grow, who, who want to learn, who want to research and really dive in. So to me, those are key things that I'm looking for to say, hey, this person is really putting forth the effort. Yeah, I, I would agree with Colleen. Um, come prepared, right? One of, the, one of the best, I would say, meetings that I had uh, with a student was the student asked like, hey, can I just have 15 minutes of your time? Um, I'm like, sure. You know, met at a coffee shop. This was pre-COVID, right? Um, but they had a list of questions that they wanted to ask. And after those questions, it was like, okay, I thank you for your time. I value your time. I really appreciate, you know, that you taking out the time to meet with me. And, you know, if there's any additional things that you would like to, to discuss, I'm open to it. But they showed that like they took that time, they didn't take the time for granted, right? They made valuable use of the time, they came with questions. So they led the meeting so far as getting the information that they wanted to know from me that was gonna be beneficial from them. So some of the things that we see sometimes is you a person will set up a meeting just to set up a meeting to say that they had a meeting with the person thinking that that's enough, right? But then you go to the meeting and they're looking for uh, the person the, the person that is in the seat of the employer to kind of drive it, 
right, and talk during the whole meeting. But I could give you a lot of information, but if that's not the information that you're looking for or is beneficial for you, then we may have just wasted your 30 to 45 minutes. So going back to what Colleen said, take that, make sure that you're using that time valuable and wisely to come to the meeting and as prepared as possible, show that you're, you're ready to go, like you've done some research on the company, but also come with some pointed questions that after you leave that meeting, you know that it was a valuable use of your time. Yeah, to piggyback off of what Colleen and Edgar say, I would say come prepared. Um, there's nothing more put that, that puts me off as a recruiter when someone says, hey, what does your company do? Tell me about your company. Now, granted, there's probably some gaps that they may not have, but as, as a, a recruiter, in the back of my mind, if you're not coming prepared, you're already going to get kind of a ding against you. Because um, if you're applying for my job, if you're – wanting to speak with me, then kind of make sure that you're coming with an agenda, kind of like Edgar said. Um, I, I want to see that you guys are kind of leading the conversation and asking me questions and, and engaging me and not necessarily me kind of engaging you. Interviewing is very much a two-way street and I don't want to feel like I'm just kind of asking you questions and you're answering and asking you questions and answering. Um, I mean, I, I'm, at my, I'm at my job for a reason. I'm at my company for a reason. Ask me, ask me those questions. I mean, there's, there's really easy questions. Why, why did you choose State Farm? Why did you choose um, this or that? I mean, in, engage the recruiter, or engage the person that's interviewing you. Awesome, awesome. Um, here's another question, guys. Um, how can I manage my nerves during a virtual interview? So we know that it's a lot different than in person and you kind of can get a feel and read body language. So for students who are trying to manage their nerves during an interview, and all of you guys don't have to answer, you can just, you know, one or two, but just how do they manage their nerves during a virtual interview? I think we should go back again to being prepared. Uh <laughs> Absolutely. Be prepared, be prepared, be prepared. Um, but also just, Take a deep breath and trust, you know, what you've done is enough and get to know that person. You're people talking to people and you can't take that lightly because I, I think it is truly, it should be a conversation. You know, I think everyone wants to connect and take that approach. Thanks. Um, so y'all hear that. Preparation is key. You've got to be prepared. Um, when in a professional or a virtual uh, professional environment, is it unprofessional to turn my camera off? So this is my take on that. Uh, for one, in this virtual environment that we're in, um, I think that uh, it, there's, it's, it's on both sides. Sides, right? Some people don't know to turn the camera on. Some people not sure. Some people will to automatically. So I think, you know, when you're in meetings and things, if everyone has their camera on, <laughs> then that may be the precedent that has been set, right? Um, some, a lot of the times though, I think going into the meeting, and these is even for employers, right? We should be um, letting it be known of what that expectation is, mm -hmm. right? So we shouldn't just go into the meeting as an employer or as a leader or whatever it is, and then everyone not really be sure. So that expectation really should be set on our end. But if it hasn't been set, right, then you can look at it and say, okay, you know, is everyone else do as everyone else have their camera on uh, depending on the environment you may ask hey are we doing video you know this this meeting uh, but depending on your personality as well I'm an outgoing person so I'm gonna take the lead to be honest with you so I'll go ahead and turn my camera on and wait for someone to say oh well because I think what that does a lot of times is people may say oh you know what yeah let's do that let's turn our cameras on so we can see everyone as opposed to them shutting it down Right. So from a personality standpoint, if that's something that is definitely your personality and you're, again, a relational person, you like that face to face interaction, you know, go ahead and throw it on if, you, if the precedent hasn't been set. But I would also put that onus on us as employers or those that are leading the meeting to set that precedent in this environment that we're in. Awesome. Awesome. Um, for either one of you guys who kind of conduct um, Inf informative interviews or informational interviews if someone just reaches out to you and say hey I just want to learn about what you do how many questions are appropriate to ask like is there a set number or um, how many questions would you feel comfortable taking during a, a inform informational interview so I, I personally don't think there's 
uh, like a defined number. Um, Cause I've done, inf I've done informative interviews where I've had like two or three questions and the based off of what the, what the person that I was interviewing me said, I had other questions. So, I mean, I would say come with maybe a set of 10 questions. If I have to throw out a number, you're probably not going to get to all 10. And in, you, in fact, you'll probably get to three, but of those three questions, there's going to be branch questions that you ask. Um, it kind of goes back to, to what everybody is saying is come prepared, be engaging, and it will, it will honestly flow. Um, oddly enough, even though I'm a recruiter and I'm, I seem very personable, um, about 10 years ago, I was the nervous Nelly too um, and, and didn't like speaking. But if you think of interviews as just kind of meeting somebody, your, your, your colleague at a bar or uh, at the grocery store, I mean, that's all the interview was and, and, and that's what's gonna cal calm your nerves. Don't think of it as an interview, think of it as a conversation and it will, it will kind of smooth, smooth from there. Thank you. We've got a question from the chat. It says, how do I prepare for a, for a live interviews versus pre-recorded interviews? I've never done a pre-recorded interview, so I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, you know, I, I think what I would include it because it is a virtual setting and you've got added complications, perhaps with technology difficulties that you may find yourself with. Um, I would always recommend uh, testing everything out beforehand. Um, you know, maybe log on, you know, minimum five minutes early um, just to make sure, but over communicate if need be. Um, you know, I, I've noticed that, you know, yes, you want to have your notes in front of you. And, you know, I may even be jotting down some notes as well, whether I'm typing or handwriting. And I'll say, hey, I'm, I'm just writing this down. If there is a lag, there's the silence. Because you, I mean, I'm a talker, but I, at the same time, I, I don't want it to come across as I'm being rude or that I'm, I don't have anything left to say. I just want to make sure I'm capturing our conversation. And I would hope that um, the person I'm speaking with is, you know, if they're also, you know, looking distracted, tell, tell me what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, just as a career counselor, I would say just um, record yourself, practice talking, practice in the mirror and record yourself using your phone or, you know, uh, you know, some type of uh, recording device on your laptop. The more you practice, the more comfortable you'll be answering those questions. Saying Thank it you. out loud. Yes, it's one thing to read, you know, what you've written down, but saying it out loud. <laughs> you brought up a good point, Colleen, and that was actually one of our questions. Is it rude? or unprofessional if you're taking notes during an interview? Again, I think if you're communicating what you're doing, I, I, I think it's great. I, I think it shows initiative. I think it shows you're genuinely interested in the you know conversation that we're having. Uh, so to me, I, I, I fully support that. But at the same time, communicate what you're doing. I, I, I don't want to assume you're you've got your phone and you're texting your friend. I, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to be thinking that. So don't let me go to that place. Right, right. Um, I see another question in the chat. It says, um, is it professionally okay to have bookshelves in my background when I am on camera or does my background have to be blank? So um, one of the things I would say is, it, you know, in regards to these, these type of environments in the virtual, um, I know for State Farm, we do put like, um, we have videos on YouTube of, you know, interviewing tips and those type of things from the virtual environment. So I would say do research on that as well. But um, now this is one of the things that I say uh, when it comes down to, especially the recorded videos. Um, you're, you're going to record this and send it into someone. You don't get the opportunity to see how they're reacting to your questions and your responses, right? So I, I want to be as have the least amount of distractions as possible. And I'll be honest with you, when we're sitting and watching hundreds of videos and we're back to back day after day, um, sometimes you can be sitting there and you can get into a lull and it's like, okay, what book, what are those books that they're reading? Let me see, is those interesting? Have I read one of those books, right? And so it can be distracting at times. And so what I would say is you want the attention to be on you and the answers that you're providing. Yes, a bookshelf looks nice in the background, but what value is it adding at the time for your actual interview and them getting to know who you are, hearing the questions that you, uh, the responses that you're providing. 
So I don't say that it's a no-go if you can't find anywhere else in your house, but if at all possible, right, I would want to make sure that I'm being providing the least amount of distractions and keeping the focus directly on me and the answers that I'm providing. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, speaking of, uh, you know, technology and, and we know technology is great when it works. However, we know technology is not always reliable. So um, if a student, um, you know, is experiencing some technical issues um, or they're, or they're having some technical issues pr uh, prior to the interview or before the interview, what should they do? Well, to piggyback off what Colleen said, I mean, test, test the technology beforehand. Don't, don't expect to have an interview at 12 and log on at 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. At 11.55, notice that it's not working. Send the recruiter or send whoever the message you just say, hey, my video is not working. Is that okay? Most mm -hmm. I'll say, yes, it's okay. We can schedule another time to do it but at least give them the opportunity to say, hey, let's reschedule or hey, I, I really needed to do video. Um, so just, it, it all honestly all, is, all goes back to be prepared. Don't, don't expect to have an interview at 12 and join the, the video interview at 12. Start at 11.55, start at 11.50, do it the night before. Um, I mean, call, call, call one of your buddies up and say, hey, I have a Zoom interview. Can we test this out for five minutes to make sure everything works? Um, the worst thing is when I get on and I'm expecting video and you're, you're fumbling, oh, my video doesn't work or my phone doesn't work, let me dial in. Okay. Right. Awesome, Jordan. We only have about five more minutes, guys. So I'm going to just do a roundabout for each of you guys and share with the students your top, I guess, three three to five um, best uh, virtual interviewing um, or virtual networking practices? Ooh, was this on the list of questions? <laughs> it was, but not necessarily the same way. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm like, man, I wasn't prepared for this one, I don't think. Um, so, so I'll go, I'll try to make this quick. Uh, the, the, we're, we're in a virtual environment, right? Um, so there's no way around it right now. Like we don't have the options, right? Before we had the options of, okay, maybe in person or maybe, you know, do it this way. This is the environment that we're in. So we have to adapt right now to the environment that we're in. And so as much as you possibly can get comfortable being uncomfortable, right? If this is an uncomfortable space with you, become comfortable, comfortable being uncomfortable right now, right? But also understand that in this environment, it is competitive as well. Like the landscape is, is, is kind of even for everyone. There's not people going to the office and there's not people meeting, you know, for, for, the, for the meetups right now. So everyone's on this same platform. And so you have to put yourself in this environment and say, okay, if this is uncomfortable for me, I have to now become comfortable being uncomfortable. And then take this opportunity to push the envelope as far as you possibly can to make those connections, to build those relationships in this type of environment. Awesome, thank you, Edgar. Mm -hmm. Well, and I don't know who is in this audience that doesn't have a profile on LinkedIn but I highly recommend it. Uh, I think it's important to make sure it's you know professional. Um, but really start you know I, I think in terms of you know building relationships, you can leverage those relationships. If there's folks out there who you'd like to meet, ask for an introduction. Uh, if there's an industry that or a company that looks interesting to you and your friend knows so somebody over there, ask ask for that introduction. I. I think so, so often people are afraid to ask for, for some help. And I, you know, I think you, if you are uncomfortable, get comfortable in being uncomfortable and, and ask, ask for help. Because I think right now, um, I, I think everyone is very generous uh, of their time and their talents and are willing to uh, step up and, and, you know, really help folks out, so. Thank you, Colleen. I mean, just to piggyback of what, what Edgar and, and Colleen said, I mean, have, have LinkedIn and be comfortable being uncomfortable. I mean, don't, don't just apply online. Reach out to them on LinkedIn and say, hey, I, I applied online. Would love to just spend 15 minutes talking to you about X company. I mean, make those, make those reach outs, make those connections. Um, 
the job may not be the right fit at the right time, but if you make that connection, you're going to stand out in my mind of, hey, this person took the initiative. They didn't just apply and expect me to call them back. They, they went that extra mile. They wanted to make sure that they were known. They wanted to make sure that they were on the top of my list. Um, so th that's kind of my, my thing. Um, and I don't know if this kind of answers any question and I, and I joined late, but in terms of interviews, I would follow the 80-20 rule. Um, and what I mean by that is spend 80% of your time on the first part of your career. It tr Sorry, let me rephrase it. Spend 20% of the time on the first part of your career and 80% of the time on the last 20%. It's great that you did all these things in high school and you had all these internships and you, oh, you opened up a car wash and all of that. But if that was more than five years ago, that's not relevant now. I want to know what you've done now. So what I, what I call the 80-20 rule, spend 80% of the time on the last 20% of your career, spend 20% on the, of your time on the last on the first 80%. Wow, you guys have just shared so much value, uh, valuable information. Like um, this panel has really been um, just, just such a, a mind blowing experience for the students because um, you guys are sharing, you're, you're recruiters, you, you are talking to students and talking to um, candidates each and every day. So, you know, you're, you're in the fire with them. And, and I think it's a, a learning environment for everyone during this virtual, um, this forced virtual time. And um, Edgar said, be comfortable being uncomfortable, you know, and push the envelope. And I think everybody has to do that. Um, Colleen showed it, told us, make sure that your LinkedIn profile is professional. How many times have you heard that from your career counselors and from your professors? Make sure your LinkedIn profile is professional. Not only your LinkedIn profile, but your Handshake profile, because they are also on Handshake looking, looking at your profile. So make sure you're going the extra mile to stand out. Um, and also, don't be afraid to reach out to other people um, and ask for help. All of the employers today have been so generous in sharing their contact information. Don't let this be your last time reaching out to them, especially if you're interested in their company and organization. And then the 80-20 rule. Gosh, I've got to use that one, Jordan. <laughs> Keisha and I have got to add that one because I like that. You know, focus only, you know, the, the first 20%, 80% on the, the, the last 20% like the last 20% because those are the last two years, that's where you're really getting the bulk of your most relevant experience. So we really appreciate you guys. Um, students, make sure that you get this screenshot because this is the screenshot that you need to receive your business communications lab credit. Um, and, uh, and if you've already taken your picture, that's fine as well, but make sure before we let our, our guests go um, that you get that um, screenshot that you need for credit. We appreciate each of you guys. Thank you so much for your time and students. Mm -hmm. We appreciate all of you. Um, for staying engaged. We've had over 50 students um, the entire I vacation. cannot see the screen. You can't see the screen. No, no, no. It's just a screen. Just see, we just need screenshot proof that you're here. It doesn't have to be a particular slide. You're fine. Yeah, you're fine. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, we've had over 50 students engaged from the beginning of, of the virtual etiquette workshop. So that means that, you know, we're obviously offering something of value for you guys. And we hope that in this virtual environment that is more accommodating for your schedules and for your work life balance and your um, school life balance. So thank you again, guys. We appreciate thank you. you. Have a good one. Bye bye. Have a great one. Thank you.